You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. What do you consider to be the greatest threats facing the Mississippi River today? There are some readily uh, uh, available culprits. Um, aquatic invasive fish species, Asian carp, Asian carp are working their way up the Mississippi. If they get an established reproducing population in the Twin Cities area here, that will have a dramatic impact on how we use the water itself. Um, they've been known, the, the ones that jump out of the water, have been known to jump out of the water and be startled even at canoe paddles, much less small engines. That would really put a damper on people using the river recreationally. Uh, sediment is a challenge here. Water quality is a sediment. Right now in Minneapolis, the river is impaired. That is EPA, uh, Clean Water Act language for polluted for four substances. Um, flooding, down, particularly downstream from where the Minnesota River comes in, is a perennial problem. There was a concern a year and a half ago in, two, in uh, 2011 that that flood might be the greatest flood on record. Climate change will undoubtedly affect the hydrology of the Mississippi River as we get uh, more uh, uh, intense rain events and then interspersed with uh, more uh, prolonged drought events. But I think really the greatest threat is that over all these problems and as big a river as the Mississippi is, we haven't yet found a way to amass the science to really tell us the state the river is in, along with the governance and policy that will help us do something about that, and along with the community engagement that will help us think of our needs to be stewards of the river. So most of our narratives of the Mississippi are kind of a, mod, uh, a modification of Huck Finn. Oh yeah, I used to go down there and play, and it's, the river is freedom, and it's always great, but we haven't thought about ourselves as stewards as necessary caretakers of the future of this river. In the Twin Cities, the Mississippi National River has 26 local units of government, all within the, the, the park's boundaries, all with their own independent zoning and planning and land use authority. Multiply that along the 2,500 miles of the Mississippi, you have something that's borderline ungovernable. And the science is really complicated. It is a big river. It's maybe the most studied river in the world, but there's still a lot we need to know. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. Did that law help to clean up pollutants in the Mississippi? It was essential. It was essential. Prior to that act, cities in here, the regional pig's eye treatment plant went online in 1938 because the cities in, in the region realized they just needed to do that. But there was nothing to stop factories from just pushing whatever they wanted to, to, um, to push into the, into the river, just straight into the river. Um, together that created a climate where nobody would want to go down and use the river recreationally. Nobody would want to, would think of having a, a nice summer evening sitting and relaxing by the river and sort of enjoying its beauty. Um, that just wasn't going to happen. Clean Water Act, by cleaning up point source pollution, um, municipal wastewater and, and industrial um, the wastewater treatment plants, um, really made it possible for so many of the other things that have taken place subsequently. Do we still need to worry about river pollution? Absolutely. Um, for two reasons, one of which is we're, at the, we're near the headwaters. We're, the Twin Cities is the farthest upstream municipal uh, concentration of population on the entire Mississippi River. Some people estimate that there are 25 to 30 million people who depend on the Mississippi River for drinking water. All of that water downstream comes through our cities. We need to pay attention to what we pass on downstream. The philosopher Wendell Berry has a golden rule of water which says, do unto people downstream the way you wish people upstream would do unto you. And it's important for just a kind of ethical reason. We ought to take care of the things that come through. The river, the Met Council in its 2030 goals had as a goal that the Mississippi River, when it leaves the Met Council region, would be as clean as it is when it comes in. That's just a thing we ought to do for people downstream. It's also a very good economic goal. Um, it costs a lot of money to clean up water. 
and to filter water, and it costs more the dirtier the water is. Um, there are things in the water now, contaminants of emerging concern, that people don't yet know really how to measure. They don't know what the impacts are. Um, as those things become better known, it may be that there are impacts that carry into human beings for a longer period of time or in ways we don't yet understand. These are all part of the vitality of a, of a city. You can't really think of having a destination city like that without having things like clean waters. People call us, sometimes we refer to it as ecosystem services. What's the dollar value of clean water in a region? That's partly measured by the recreation economy that people come and use the river or Psycho Susie's is a restaurant on the northeast side that takes tremendous advantage of its location on the Mississippi River. It's probably the hottest seat in town to get on, out on their patio in the summertime. That's directly a benefit of the clean water of the Mississippi River. But also think about what it would cost to clean the water up. New Orleans is roughly the size of the two central cities put together. New Orleans is back up to about five or 600,000. Two central cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, a little bigger than that. What does it cost New Orleans to clean that water so that its citizens can turn on the tap or hit a water fountain and take a drink? Um, that cost is an ecosystem service. What steps are being taken to prevent the spread of invasive species in the river? Uh, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk. Um, the Park Service, again, acting as a convener with that Park Service kind of reputation, has convened a, um, an, an interagency task force. It has the Park Service, the Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, the state DNR, uh, the governor is very interested in this, the state DNR is very interested in this. They're clearly interested in preserving the quality of the fishery across the Mississippi River watershed in Minnesota. Um, nobody quite knows where the carp are. Nobody knows what it takes to have an established breeding, reproducing population. So if you catch a couple, does that mean that there's a lot? Does that mean there's very few? Typically downstream, the graph of presence has gone along at a very low level and then it's just skyrocketed. It appears that the way these fish work is that you can have a few of them, a few of them, a few of them, and then over a space of two seasons, they blow up and become most of the biomass, most of the fish in the river downstream in some parts of the river are carp. The only 100% known way to keep them from coming upstream at this point is to close locks. That is highly controversial. The locks up to and including San Anthony Falls are still used daily during the season by commercial navigation. That's unlikely to change. Although the Park Service this year did ask for voluntary non-use of locks by recreational boaters. So the Paddleford Packet Boat Company stays in the St. Paul Pool. They don't go up past the Ford Dam. Uh, there was a packet boat on Boom Island in Minneapolis, not a packet boat, a, 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 a cruise boat facility, weddings and receptions and stuff like that. They now don't go through St. Anthony Falls locks. The Park Service's own programs for canoeing and getting kids out on the water no longer uses the locks. So Wilderness Inquiry, which has a canoe uh, program. I was on it last weekend, as a matter of fact. They no longer will put in at the University of Minnesota, go through the locks at the Ford Dam and come out at Hidden Falls. So it's changed the way people recreate on the river. You'll still see people go through. The locks by federal law are open and have to open for anybody who wants to go through, and that's for free. The city of Minneapolis has revealed plans to revitalize the riverfront area. More on these plans when Access returns. Access Minnesota will return after these messages.